Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Dumb SEO Questions, episode 314. Each week uh, we meet here to answer the questions asked on the um, Dumb SEO Questions Facebook group and for a limited time uh, also on the uh, SEO Questions community on Google+. Um, with us tonight, we have Tim Kappa. Tim is uh, CEO of OnlineOwnership.com. Uh, he's also a, um, um, a Google product expert uh, in the um, Google My Business community. Micah Fisher-Kirshner is uh, uh, head of SEO um, for Turn River Capital in the United States. Um, he's based on the west coast of the USA. Um, and Micah fisher Kirsch, no, sorry, not Micah. Uh, it's all right, brain lapse. Uh, Masataki Wasa is um, webmaster of wasaweb.net. Um, he's a, a Google top contributor, oh, sorry, a Google product expert um, on the um, uh, AdSense uh, community. He's based in Wimbledon uh, in the uh, UK. And Tim is based um, in um, uh, Corby, about 100 miles uh, north of London. We've got 10 questions tonight. Um, let's see the, the first one. Uh, we answered dumb SEO questions here, and he said, or Rajam Roos, uh, uh, she said, um, I just did a super dumb thing for local SEO. Um, I rented out two mailboxes that have suite numbers. The main reason that I work two completely separate oh, is that I work two completely separate businesses from home, and I'd like to have a contact address on my websites, but I don't want to use my home address. So... Um, when I changed it in Google My Business, they suspended both of my accounts because it goes against their policy of listing an address that isn't where your office is located. And I'm just going to revert to putting my service area again. My question is that I still would like to have an address on my websites. How much will that affect local SEO if the address uh, is not being shown on Google My Business? These are not local-based businesses. One is national and the other is national and international. Thanks so much for your suggestions. For some reason, this address thing has been a thorn in my side. Now, don't all fight over this. Um, well, oof. okay, hang on, I just got back. Uh, what, what has this person done? Um, she listed two um, uh, addresses, um, but not the addresses that, of her actual office because she works from home. Um, and uh, Google My Business um, canned them both. <laughs> okay, so delete those out of your dashboard, firstly. Uh, you don't want those in your dashboard because if you create another, a third one with those uh, suspended ones in there, then it's just not going to happen. Um, delete them both out of your dashboard. Just see if they um, are actually completely suspended first. So do a quick search for the name and, and that in maps uh, with the address you use to see if it actually appears. Um, with a bit of luck, they've been literally removed. Um, then go ahead and create a new one. Um, go ahead and create a new one. Uh, but select yourself as a select yourself as a service area business, which you can use your home address. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't show up. And um, and uh, essentially, uh, you know, then then it'll be approved. Um, because you've hid, hid your address that you are a service area business. You work from, um, you work from, or you service people at their location as such. Um, 
Now, if you've gone and built citations for the other addresses already, that's going to cause a little bit of confusion as such. Um, what would you do in that situation? We, I think you should go through those citations and just um, a lot of them will uh, allow you to remove uh, or update the addresses uh, or actually hide your address. So in those cases, you should just hide your address um, and say, you know, that you're a serviced, a service business, depending on what citations you used. A lot of the main aggregators and that allow you to do that now. Um, yeah, so essentially remove them um, and, and then just create the new one with your as a service area business. Thank you, Tim. Anybody else? Okay, number two on our run list is from Jay Lowe. Um, and it's titled, Is it still a good idea to inline small CSS? Um, a while ago, if you round the lighthouse, Google might suggest optimizing CSS delivery by uh, inline small CSS. Uh, but recently, uh, it seems that they uh, have deprecated this as the best practice and suggest using multiple separate external CSS and use a media query uh, in a tag to specify what kind of devices will use that uh, CSS. And there's a URL which can be seen uh, on the Dumb SEO Questions Facebook group. Um, JLA goes on to say, that being said, is it still a good idea to inline small CSS? Um, and if so, why uh, does Lighthouse not suggest it anymore? Is that because it's hard to maintain? Uh, let me know your thoughts on this. Thanks. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I think it, part of it potentially comes down to um, what they see in aggregate and what kind of um, becomes a larger of a problem for them. So they'll make tweaks to kind of what the recommendations are. Um, I wouldn't say that the in-house CSS is problematic or anything. It's just it will come down to what they think will help speed up the web faster um, across the whole group of people. So, you know, you want to use kind of those kinds of tools as a good um, arbitrator for how to improve, but also working with your dev person to say, okay, which is, will these actually improve the speed of our site consistently? Um, and if keeping in mind is still going to be faster, then stay with that than, say, having say too many uh, or having many kind of external CSS files. Um, it, it, it's, again, the tool is mostly for people who don't know what kind of area to focus on or not aware, and it, it allows a greater range of people to say, hey, work with a dev and be like, these are things that I need to actually go and or need to be fixed. Let's take a look and see if this makes sense. Um, so again, if it doesn't make sense and it's not actually speeding up your site, then don't worry too much if you're not hitting everything uh, in line with what Lighthouse is saying. Thank you, Micah. Anybody else? All right, let's uh, move on for that. Uh, Todd Weiss uh, asked a question. It's titled uh, URL Structure and Breadcrumbs. Todd said, it's been a while since I've dealt with a scenario like this and so I wanted to get some thoughts. The background is uh, I'm building a site uh, for a client and from a navigational perspective, we've had to organize a resources section as a sub item of their company section. The letter of, letter of which is represented uh, in uh, top uh, navigation, uh, the former of which appears in a pop-up menu. I'm confused already usually takes longer. Um, this 
resources section will have uh, children handling white papers, uh, case studies, videos, blog, uh, etc. Two questions. One about URL structure and the second is about bread, breadcrumbs. My gut was that even though resources is a sub of company in the NAV, um, from uh, a URL lab, um, so I just have to go back a bit. I got ahead of myself there. Sorry about that. Okay, from a URL perspective, still hang it off the root instead of at slash company slash resources. Um, I just wanted to get opinions on that. In my mind, I was just trying to avoid having slash company slash resources slash white papers and that pathing uh, getting overly long from a user experience perspective uh, as much as uh, pure uh, SEO uh, perspective. The second question, if I go to that approach, should bread breadcrumbs for resources and the things under it have company represented in the trail? Brackets, i.e. reflective of the navigational structure, in bracket. Or should it reflect the simplified pathing of the, the URL structure, which is actually the default WordPress behavior happening? Thanks. Uh, everyone have a happy and safe new year. Okay, so I think I follow. Um, my general perspective is that the length or the multiple subpath subdirectories of a URL is not an issue both UX and SEO wise. Um, if the information provided by those helps make things more clear, then that's a benefit on both ends. Um, <clears throat> if as Michael Martinez notes in the first comment there that there is empty uh, subdirectories, then then you might as well just not use it and move things up um, when appropriate. Um, I I mean to me you know does it make sense to have a resource section in your company versus you know if it's a resource like guides and white papers and stuff that probably doesn't fit under company, um, but I don't think it's a huge deal if there's a if there's a direct mismatch between what's in the main nav versus your URL structure. Um, a lot of the stuff often kind of is tweaked and everything uh, within said structure um, on many sites because uh, things move and testing testing kind of new layouts and, and drop down navs oftentimes. So I think what I would suggest is thinking what what makes Sense for a user that's coming in uh, and then able to find kind of the path back up to the home page or allowing the users to know pretty quickly where they are within the website as more of the priority um, for how to structure the URL itself and how to thus then how to structure the the breakthroughs in that way. Um, I don't again I just don't think the Mismatch with the two, between the two makes a huge difference. I don't think that uh, having it being overly long is an issue. I just think in the end, it's just making sure that it makes sense uh, within your website for where everything flows and having within the architecture uh, properly so that users make it, it. People can go through it. They can go back up, and there's content on each of those layers so that in the end, um, it, it's not just something that's uh, empty and unhelpful. Thank you, Martin. Anybody else? Okay, let's move on to the next. This one from JLo again. Um, how does Google's mobile-friendly site tester work? Recently, I found that every time I run Google's mobile-friendly site tester, it shows slightly different results. For example, one time it said that there were 12 pages not loaded. Another time it said there were nine completely different pages that were not loaded. 
Um, sometimes uh, I uh, even see a page is not mobile friendly. And then when I read run it again, it changes its mind and says it is mobile friendly. I wonder how uh, this uh, site tester works and why it, this happens all the time. Thank you, everyone. I don't know. <laughs> what I would also look at is instead of using that, um, use your URL inspection in Google Search Console. Um, that seems to be more consistent. Uh, but recently I also found it saying some pages are not mobile friendly. So yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Thank you, Tim. Anybody else? Okay, I see some great answers uh, also from uh, um, Michael Martinez. Um, he looks after questions as soon as they're asked uh, through, during the week. And for that, we're truly thankful. Um, Tyler Marin asked a question titled, Landing Page for a Long-Term Recurring Event. Tyler said, uh, I have a recurring bi-monthly event used for prospecting. It is currently on ClickFunnels. For a long-term recurring event, would I be better served with the landing page being on my actual website instead? It's a relatively low search volume keyword, but from my ads, I get thousands of visitors. Um, well, personally, yeah. I mean, if it's if it's if it's a regular happening thing, um, I would have it on your own site. Um, you know, then you list you list the one that's the, you know this event that's coming up. Um, as that expires, the new one goes up, saying you know, and then you can have your sign up features on it. Um, you know, details to the event, you construct a data markup. Um, so that event will actually be pulling through to the actual location. You'll also have the rich snippet, additional event rich snippet and search queries on your own site, on your own property. So for me, yeah, I would have it on your own site. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. Um, Generally, if something's reoccurring and has some form of search value, you, I mean, for the most part, all this stuff should, should be on your site anyway. Like, uh, and granted, I'm not familiar with ClickFunnels, but I would say even your ads should be on your own site. Um, it, it, kind of the landing page and your domain quality scores that I presume from the paid side would, would make a difference. So, um, that said, you know, your, your pages don't always have to be your SEO one and your paid one don't have to be the exact same page. So you can just build one and leave your, your paid site on the ClickFunnels side of things. So, um, yeah, you can always just leave them as separate. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. Um, let's um, move on to the next. This one from Craig Anthony. Um, he said both HTTP and HTTPS URLs are re being reported as duplicates. Craig said, hello, everyone. A Screaming Frog report shows uh, URL duplicates as it's reading both HTTP and HTTPS. Um, further investigation shows both have status code 200. How do I fix this, please? I can save you guys some breath because George G um, has uh, said in the, the um, um, Facebook group, uh, the Damasio Questions Facebook group, he said simply 301 redirect HTTP to HTTPS. And I think we can safely move on from that. Okay. Um, Glenn Cooper uh, has a question titled, a rotating featured snippet. 
Glenn said, afternoon, chaps. Um, Re-featured featured snippets. Um, Google seems to be rotating the snippet for one keyword between my site and a couple of other competitors. Question. What can I do to uh, keep the spot? It's a good keyword and I'd like to keep the snippet. And that would be a smiley face. Mm, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that's uh, it's going to rotate. You know, Google's trying to figure out which users find more useful. Um, and I'm assuming you mean the like the, the answer box on the top. I'm guessing that's what you mean. It's switching between different sites. Um, yeah, you know, Google tests, they see, you know, they want to see which, which one's better. Um, I see it with, uh, particularly with when you've taken or, you, you know, you, you've targeted someone else's um, uh, featured snippet um, and you've usurped theirs, you will see Google periodically switching between the original and yours. Um, um because they want to see which one is 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 providing uh, you know uh, which which is more useful to the user um that's their intention their intention is not to come to you <laughs> um you know it, it's in fact a lot of the featured snippets where you know i've targeted over the years um we've actually seen a decrease in traffic to those particular pages rather than an increase which you would hope to get um especially if it's um you know uh, you've answered the question literally within the first paragraph or you know it's like a step by step um and you've and they literally list the entire steps and then there's no need to click through to your your site um so the thing is yeah um I don't, I, I don't really know if there's a guaranteed way. Um, it's a question of just providing that, ex, that, that uh, a better resource. And equally, there's, there's no guarantee on what the user is perceiving from that featured snippet, which you can't tell because Google is looking at that metric. They do, in effect, they're doing their own A-B testing between the two, or sometimes three, um, to see which is better uh, and the users find better. So, yeah, you know, I, I couldn't, yeah, I, yeah, I don't think there's a... Uh, yeah, probably one of the best things uh, to do at that point um, is just see if, if you've got the money to spend, then run a, run a survey or, or um, not a survey, but like a, a kind of a, well, you could do a survey, but you can also do um, a report seeing which one gets better CTR. So if you're if you're kind of trying to get people more you know users to click on which one or read through, do a CTR report um, and with the search result there to see kind of what might perform better. And there's a good possible you know, like as Tim's saying, it they're trying to figure out which one's better and might be pretty close. So if you're able to write in an even better featured snippet based on um, kind of doing a some kind of study uh, and and figured out kind of what might work better that might get you to be solidified in that spot but even then you're only kind of guesstimating what uh, Google might be looking at at least it's something better than nothing I would say thank you guys um, all right let's um, move on to the next one This one is from KJ Subs, and it's a simple question. What does siloed structure mean in SEO? Well, siloed structure is exactly as you kind of created. You know, you've got your top line category. So let's say it's uh, example.com forward slash elephants. Right, that's your main that's your main category right that's your elephant category page and then you're going to have 
within it. So you're going to have, you may have products within that. So then it would be um, forward slash pink fluffy, forward slash um, purple fluffy, forward slash, you know, so it's content that fits within a particular string. Um, and then let's say you've got um, rhinos. So it'd be forward slash rhinos, then, it, you know, any particular products that fall within that would be, you know, your forward slash ugly rhino, forward slash green rhino. Um, so it's essentially just a, a correct, or I wouldn't say correct, because you can do it in multiple different ways. But essentially, if you think about it, you know, in terms of, um, you, you know, anything, so it's, it's the make of the car would be your top one, and then the parts within the car they all fit within it, like a BMW, and then the parts that fit within that um, all pertain to BMW. You know, you wouldn't have those BMW parts within within a, within a Mazda uh, section because uh, they just don't fit, and it's just the wrong part. So it's, it's all within a proper structure so that one, uh, search engines can understand literally what goes where, uh, but also your users, you know, depending on how, you know, if you're using breadcrumbs or uh, if you're using, if it's an e-commerce site or whatever the case may be, that it all fits within and, you know, uh, it can all be searched properly. Thank you, Tim. And we're losing you. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you next week, man. Ciao. All right. Um, anybody else on this one before we move on? Okay. Number nine on our run list uh, is from Usman uh, Ghani. It's titled A Strategy to Build Links for a New Vlog. Um, Usman said, dear sirs, um, I know content quality matters a lot, um, but we cannot deny that links also play an important role. I would like uh, if you can guide me uh, as to what strategy I should ad adapt to, uh, should adopt, I should say, um, to build um, links for a new blog with a few posts. I'm adding content more and more. Thank you. Should we answer? Um, well, I, I mean, I know, know we should answer, but um, <laughs> what do you think? Well, we get this question every so often. Um, it's just, it's, the strategies are going to vary quite dramatically based on what role your blog is playing with industry um but uh, you know you, you um it's it's kind of hard to say like what the strategy should be without knowing the site itself there's a lot of general concepts around seo and, and good content and good linking um so, uh, yeah, I mean, you could probably go with Michael's response here as well, but the the granular kind of areas of what that should entail, even the, at, all the way up to the strategic level, is very difficult without, in my opinion, without kind of more details of what the site is about. Um, to give a general theme might not be appropriate to what will work for you. So that's that's the other thing that I kind of usually qualify with that. Thank you, Monica. All right, um, let's move on to the next. I think it's our last question from Craig Anthony, and it's titled Important On-Page SEO Tasks. Craig said, I plan to improve my website, and I know I have not written meta descriptions for the 150 pages I have. I was going to dedicate the next few days to getting them all written up individually. And I noticed that Google has automatically scraped slash used the text within my H1s. 
Uh, my question is, should I bother doing this job or is there something else that I should concentrate on? Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends on what other stuff you have to do. Um, it can definitely be useful to work on your meta description so they don't look janky on the search results. Um, because Google's only going to be able to try to do its best job and it's going to have a lot of potential ellipses and just doesn't read well. So um, think of it as a little bit as your first introduction to what the page is about. So having the ability to provide a good sentence can be useful to improving your CTRs. That said, um, there may be other things on your site to help you get higher up in the search results in the first place. So uh, it should be on your list, but I wouldn't put it as like a high priority and may probably up there and as a medium at most. Thank you, Micah. Well, I've got a feeling that when I click this button, it'll be that time again. Yes, it's thank you for watching time. And um, um, I'd just like to say that we'll be back uh, at this time next week uh, to do uh, this uh, all over again. Um, we uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Uh, you watching us uh, makes uh, what we do um, worthwhile. Um, as I said, we will be back uh, at the same time next week. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, thank you.